Hi, in this video we are going to talk about the theoretical background for the so-called disjoint set or the union fine data structure. So let's get started. So okay, what is this disjoint set? It is also known as the union fine data structure and it is a data structure to keep track of a set of elements partitioned into a number of disjoint, so non-overlapping subsets. This data structure supports three main operations, the union, the find, and the make set operations. Disjoint sets can be represented with the help of linked lists, but usually we implement it with the help of a tree-like structure. And okay, you may pose the question that what does disjoint set have to do with minimal spanning trees, classical algorithms, and so on? Basically, in classical algorithm, it will be very, very useful to boost up the running time of the classical algorithm because with disjoint sets, we can decide in approximately order one, so constant time complexity, whether two vertices are in the same set or not. And basically, it is very important. Okay, so what about the make set operation? These operations, by the way, are very, very easy to implement. The make set is going to assign a distinct set to each of the items. We are going to talk about vertices, so sometimes I'm going to say vertices. So we have the X, it can be an item, it can be a vertex of a graph, whatever. But basically, we set the parent to be itself. So we create a distinct set to all the items. What about the find? The find is going to get an item, an X, and if the parent is equal to itself, so the X self, so the X parent is equal to X, then we return the X, and else we return the find X parent. So we are going to call this find method recursively on the parent. And several items can belong to the same set. It's very important. And we usually represent the set with one of its items, basically the representative of the set. And that's why if the X parent is equal to itself, it means that basically this is the root node. As I said earlier, we usually implement this data structure as a trig-like structure. And it has a root node. And basically, the root node is the representative. So no matter what item we would like to find, it's going to return the value of the root node. This is how disjoint sets work. So that's why when we search for an item with the find operation, then it's going to return with the representative. What does it mean? Is that we have the disjoint set, for example, with 4, 10, 14, 128, 55. These are the items in the disjoint set. In this case, we are not going to talk about vertices in a graph. It's going to store integers. For example, the representative of the disjoint set is going to be 4. Then if we run the find operation on the 4, we would like to find the 4. Then because the representative is 4, it's going to return 4. What if we would like to find the 10? We have been talking about that it's going to return with the representative. So it's going to return 4. What if we are looking for the 55? Because these joint sets are going to return with the representative, it's going to return 4, and so on. So basically, this is how these joint sets work. Okay. What about the union? We have the union. We have the union on the X and the Y, and basically, we are going to find the root for the X, the root for the Y, and basically, we merge them together. So the x root dot parent is going to be the y root. So the union operation is merged two disjoint sets together by connecting them according to the representatives. Okay, so far so good. But then several problems arise. For example, this tree-like structure can become unbalanced. And I'm not sure whether you are familiar with data structures, but that's why binary search trees are not a good data structures because they can get unbalanced. And when they are unbalanced, then the operations is going to be very slow. So we have to rebalance them. And this is why AVL trees and red black trees came to be. And this is the same for here. We come to the conclusion that this tree like structure can become unbalanced. So we have several options. For example, the union by rank. 
So we always attach the smaller tree to the root of the larger tree. So the tree will become more balanced and that's why the operations will be faster. What kind of operations? For example, the find operation. Then the second option is the pulse compression. We usually use both of these solutions at the same time. So union by rank plus pulse compression. Basically this pulse compression flattening the structure of the tree. We set every visited node to be connected to the root node directly. Why is it good? Because we can end up asymptotically with an ordo one constant time complexity algorithm as far as the find operation is concerned. So what about the rank? The rank is basically the depth of the tree. We have the leaf nodes, it is the rank is zero, then the zero, then the parents of the leaf nodes have the rank one, then the parent of the parent of the leaf nodes have the rank two, and basically the rank of the set is equal to the rank of the representative or the rank of the root node. And in this case, this set has the rank 2. So we attach the smaller tree to the larger one. It means we attach the tree with smaller rank to the tree with higher rank. Why is it good? Because in this case, the tree is not going to be as balanced as we do in the opposite way. So, for example, we have two disjoint sets, A and B, and C, D, E. And we would like to merge them. Of course, we have to merge them in the way that we have to attach the tree with smaller rank to the tree with highest rank. Okay, and this is the way how we saw it. We are going to attach the AB set to be the, of the other disjoint set. What about the path compression? This is basically the modified find method. We are looking for the X. And if the X parent is not equal to the X, which means that this is not the root node, this is not the representative, we are going to set the parent to be the find of the X that parent. And basically this is the recursive method call. So we are going to recursively set the parent to be the representative. I think it is a very, very elegant code. On the other hand, it is not so easy to read it. But anyways, it is a very, very elegant recursive method call. And basically, we set every vertex parent to be the representative until we bump into the representative itself. And then we return the exit parent. Okay. So basically, we have this tree-like structure, this disjoint set, as I said, the structure, this disjoint set, as I said earlier, we can represent disjoint sets with the help of tree-like structures. And for example, I would like to find the C. Because of the path compression, I'm going to call the find method recursively on the parent of C, on the B, and I come to the conclusion that the parent of B is the representative itself. So I'm going to attach this C to be the child of the representative directly. Why is it good? Because the next time I'm looking for the C, I can find it very easily and I can return with the representative. It's very, very important to know that whenever I call this find on C or B or D, all of them will return with the representative because this is how these join sets work. Whenever I call the find method on an item, it's going to return not the value of the item, but the value of the representative. So basically the root node in this case. Okay, what if I call, for example, the find D? I'm going to call the find recursively on the parent, which is the B, and the parent of B is the representative itself. So basically, we just have to rearrange the D vertex and set it to connect directly to the representative. Why is it good? Because this is why path compression came to be. Whenever we would like to find the D again, it's going to take ordo 1, so constant time complexity, to return with the representative. It's very, very important and very, very useful in cross curl algorithm. Okay, so just to summarize again, why is it good? Because the next time we want to find a C or find a D, it will take ordo 1 time because they are the direct neighbor of the representative. Algorithm will be faster because of the pass compression as well as because of the rank. Okay, so what about the applications of the disjoint set? 
Basically, it is used mostly in classical algorithm implementation. So we have to check whether adding a given edge to the minimum spanning tree would form a cycle or not. This is how classical algorithm works. We are going to talk a lot more about it in the coming videos. But for checking this, the union find data structure is extremely helpful because we can check whether a cycle is present or not in the graph in asymptotically ordo one constant time complexity. And you may pose the question that, okay, why is it asymptotically ordo one? Because of the path compression, these nodes and vertices will be connected to the representative directly. And that's why next time it's going to take ordo one time ordo one time complexity to find them. And basically that's why we say that asymptotically it takes ordo one time complexity to check whether there's a cycle in the cross scale algorithm. Hi. In this video, we are going to talk about disjoint sets and we are going to see a little illustration how it works in practice. So let's get started. First of all, as we have discussed in the theoretical section, we are going to assign a distinct set to each of the nodes in the graph. So for example, we have the A, B, C, D, E and F and all of these nodes or items, whatever we call them, is in a distinct disjoint set at the beginning and we keep merging them together. So. First, we are going to assign the rank parameter to all of these sets and the initial value is equal to zero. So that's why in the beginning, all of the disjoint set items has the rank zero. Okay, we would like to merge A and B. So we make the set with lower rank to be, to be the child of the set with higher rank. This is the property of a union find operation because it keeps the depth of the tree as low as possible. Why is it good? Because if the depth is as low as possible, it means that it is very compact. If it's compact, it means that the search operation is very, very fast. And basically this is exactly what we are looking for. And it's very important that in a disjoint set, we have to operate with the representatives only. So we are not going to deal with the other items. On every operation, we have to search for the representative of the given set. Okay, so first we have to search for A and B because there are only single items in these disjoint sets. They are the representatives by default. Okay, so we have to merge them together because they have the rank 0, 0 and we have been talking about that we have to assign the no lower rank to be the child of the set with higher rank. Here the rank parameters are equal. So basically it doesn't matter whether the A will be the parent or B will be the parent. In this case, I set A to be the parent. And it's very, very crucial and important that we increment the rank only and if only the rank parameters were the same before the merge operation. For example, before the merge operation, the rank parameter for A was zero and for B was zero. So they are the same, they are equal. So that's why we have to increment the rank parameter for the parent in this case. Okay. So let's merge, for example, B and C. First, we have to look for the representatives in these disjoint sets. So basically, we are not able to operate with B because we have to find the representatives. And it is the A, the representative in this disjoint set. The, the C is the single item, so it is the representative by default. And we have to merge them together. And we have been talking about that we have to assign the representative with lower rank value to the representative with higher rank value. So basically, the C will be the child of the A. Okay, so we have managed to merge these two disjoint sets together. And it's very important, we don't have to increment the rank parameters. Why? Because we increment the rank parameters only and only if the rank parameters were the same. In this situation, the rank parameters are not equal because the C rank parameter is zero. The rank parameter for the node A is one. They are not equal, so we don't have to bother about rank parameter increment. Okay, for example, we would like to merge D and E. First, we have to search for the representatives 
they are the single items in their disjoint set, so they are the representatives by default. They have the same rank parameters, so basically we set the parent whoever we want. In this case, I set the parent to be the node D, and we have to increment the rank parameter. Why? Because before the merge operation, the rank parameters for the two disjoint sets were the same, 0, 0. So we have to increment the parent's rank parameter. I would like to merge E with C. We have to search for the representatives. It is the D in the first disjoint set, and it's going to be the A in the second disjoint set. Because they have the same rank parameter, it doesn't matter that who's going to be the parent. What's very important, that we have to increment the rank parameter after the merge operation, because they have the same rank parameter before the operation itself. So I set, for example, the A to be the parent, and we have to increment the rank parameter. Why? Because before the merge operation, they had the same rank parameter. Okay, then we want to merge A with F. Okay, we just have to set the F to be pointing to the A. Okay, and we don't have to bother about the rank parameters because they are differ before the merge operation. So we have managed to construct or disjoint sets and basically it's very important that because of the pass compression all the nodes will connect to the representatives directly so finding the representative takes ordo one constant time complexity for every node for example we are looking for the node e then we are going to set it to point directly to the node a this is the pass compression we have been talking about and why is it good because in this case all the nodes are pointing to the representative and most of the operations we are interested in the representative. So finding the representative is going to take ordo one constant time complexity because we just have to get the parent node of the given node. For example, what's the parent for node B? It is the A. What's the parent for node D? It is the A. For node F, it is the A again and so on. So we are able to get the representative of the given disjoint set in ordo one constant time complexity and it's going to make sure that the algorithm is going to be very fast and in Kruskal algorithm for example we are going to use this disjoint set union fine data structure thanks for watching hi in this video we are going to talk about spanning tree algorithms focusing on one of the most important one the so-called Kruskal algorithm so let's get started you may pose the question that, okay, what is a spanning tree? A spanning tree of an undirected G graph is a subgraph that includes all the vertices of the G graph, but it usually doesn't include all the edges of this given graph. So in general, a tree may have several spanning trees, and we can assign a weight to each edge in this tree-like structure, or the G graph, and a minimum spanning tree is then a spanning tree with weight less than or equal to the weight of every other spanning tree. Okay, what does it mean that the weight of a tree? Of course, we have to sum up all the edges that this tree contains, contains, and basically that's what we call the weight of the tree. So we are looking for the spanning tree where the sum of the weights are the minimum, and basically that's called a minimum spanning tree. Of course, it has lots of lots of applications, for example, in big data analysis, clustering algorithms such as the k-means clustering, or finding minimum cost for a telecommunications company, laying cable to a new neighborhood, and so on. So there are two standard algorithms out there for solving this problem, the so-called Primzjarnik algorithm and the Kruskal algorithm. Both of them are greedy algorithms. Okay, so a graph may have several spanning trees as we have discussed. So for example, this is a graph. We have four vertices and we have four edges. It is not a directed graph, but whatever. Okay, what is, for example, this is a spanning tree. It contains all the vertices of the graph. And of course, it doesn't have to contain all the edges. So if we have managed to connect all the vertices with three edges only, then we don't have to consider the fourth edge. 
basically it is forbidden to add the four edge to the spanning tree we are able to connect the four vertices with the half of three edges and that's what matters okay for example this is a spanning tree we can leave a single edge and we can decide at what edge to leave out of the spanning tree we can leave the edge between vertex a and vertex f of course we can leave the edge between vertex f and vertex d as we can leave the edge between vertex A and vertex B, it's going to be a spanning tree because all the vertices are connected. Okay, so usually we are looking for the we are looking for the minimum spanning tree and the spanning tree where the sum of edge weights is the lowest possible. That's what's called the minimum spanning tree. So let's consider Kruskal's algorithm first. The heuristic is that we have to sort the edges according to their edge weights. It can be done in ordo and log n, so linear rhythmic time complexity with sorting algorithms such as merge sort or quick sort. Then we have to use something called the union fine data structure or the disjoint set. So we start adding edges to the minimum spanning tree and we want to make sure that there will be no cycles in the spanning tree. This is the main problem, and it can be done in ordo log v, so logarithmic time complexity, with the help of union fine data structure. Okay, you may guess that we could use a heap abstract data type instead of sorting the edges in the beginning, but the running time would be the same. So sometimes Kruskal's algorithm is implemented with priority queues, and sometimes the first step is to sort the edges according to its edge weights at the beginning. Okay, there are several solutions to the same problem. So the worst case running time is ordo e log e, where the e denotes the number of edges in the graph, so we can use it for huge graphs as well. If the edges are sorted, then the algorithm will be quasi-linear. If you multiply the weights with a constant or add a constant to the edge weights, the result will be the same. And basically, it's kind of a symmetry. For example, in physics, as invariant is a property of the system that remains unchanged under some transformation. And these symmetries are very, very important part in theoretical physics. Whatever, what's important is that in crossing trees are invariant under the transformation of these weights, the addition or the multiplication of the weights by some constant, and sometimes it can prove to be very important. Okay. So let's consider the situation when we have a graph like this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So we have seven vertices, and okay, we have some undirected edges with edge weights 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 6, 10, and so on. And we would like to find the minimum spanning tree. Of course, as I said earlier, there are several spanning trees for this given graph. We are able to connect all the vertices such that it's going to yield a spanning tree. But we are looking for the minimum spanning tree. So the spanning tree that if we sum up all the edge weights, then it's going to be the lowest possible. Okay, going to be the lowest possible. Okay, so first we have to sort the edge weights 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 5, 5, 6, and 10. And on every iteration, we have to make sure whether by adding a new edge, will there be a cycle or not. And basically, this is why union fine data structure is very helpful, because we are able to check it in constant time complexity, whether will there be a cycle or not. So first, we are going to initialize a disjoint set, and we are going to assign a distinct set to each of the nodes. So the A will be in a distinct set, the B will be in a distinct set, the C, the D, E, F, and G will be in different distinct unique sets at the beginning. And okay, at the beginning we have as many sets as the number of vertices, and when adding an edge, we merge two sets together, and pops when there is only a single set remains. So for example, let's consider the first edge in the sorted list, it is the warm. We pose the question that, okay, are these vertices are in distinct disjoint sets? And we come to the conclusion that, yeah, C has a distinct disjoint set and the D has a distinct disjoint set. So we can merge together. 
okay and basically we consider this edge to be the part of the minimum spanning tree then we consider the next edge you may come to the conclusion that okay we have two edges with edge weight 2 and that's why we can consider any of them for example this one and we pose the question again we have to decide that whether there will be a cycle if we add this edge to the spanning tree and basically it is the same problem to ask that are the vertex a and b are in distinct disjoint sets illustration that a is in a distinct set and b is in a distinct set so we can merge them and add this edge to the minimum spanning tree because we come to the conclusion that adding this edge to the minimum spanning tree is not going to form a cycle what about the next edge okay it has the edge weight too as well okay we come to the conclusion that they are in distinct sets so we are able to merge them first of all and we are able to add this edge to the minimum spanning tree what about the next edge the three between vertex b and vertex e okay they are in distinct disjoint sets so we are able to merge them as well as add this edge to the minimum spanning tree what about the next one they are in distinct disjoint sets so we are able to merge them first of all and add this edge to the minimum spanning tree what about the next one this is the four this is the four and we come to the conclusion that the vertex e and the vertex d are in the same disjoint set what does it mean it means that adding this edge to the minimum spanning tree would form a cycle and this is exactly what we would like to avoid so that's why we are not going to add this edge to the minimum spanning tree okay it's not going to be a good solution what about the next one the edge between vertex a and vertex c we take a look at the disjoint sets and we come to the conclusion that these vertices are in the same disjoint sets what does it mean that adding this edge to the minimum spanning tree would form a cycle and we would like to avoid forming cycles so that's why it is not a good solution as well okay what about the next one the edge 5 between vertex f and vertex g they are in distinct sets so we so we are able to merge the sets and we are able to add this edge to the minimum spanning tree and we come to the conclusion that there is a single set remains which means that this is the end of the algorithm we have managed to get the minimal spanning tree with the help of Kruskal algorithm and the minimal cost is we just have to sum up the cost of the green edges 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 5 which is 16 so we have managed to found the minimum spanning tree with the help of Kruskal algorithm and we come to the conclusion that it's going to take 16 units to form this minimal spanning tree this is the lowest cost possible so that's all about the theory for Kruskal algorithm thanks for hi in this video we are going to talk about the concrete implementation of the Kruskal algorithm it's not going to be the prettiest algorithm I mean as far as the implementation is concerned I'm going to implement it with the help of disjoint sets and I'm going to implement it in an object oriented way we could use two-dimensional arrays and C++ and C-like code structure but I would like to avoid that because this is Java and this is object-oriented environment so okay first of all I'm going to create a new package for example with the name Kruskal I'm going to create several classes first I'm going to create the vertex class it's going to represent the vertex in the given physical graph we are going to have an edge it's going to be the edges in the graph and we are going to have another clause basically it is needed basically it is needed for the disjoint set implementation if you recall for the theoretical section we have been discussing that we are going to assign an empty set to all the vertices in the graph at the beginning and basically these are going to be the disjoint sets and basically we have to merge these disjoint sets in order to decide in constant time complexity whether adding a new edge will form a cycle or not and if you may recall 
the disjoint set can be implemented with the help of linked lists and with the help of tree-like structure. And basically, this node is the tree-like structure nodes. We are going to implement disjoint sets with the help of a tree-like structure. And of course, as usual, a tree-like structure contains nodes. So this node is basically is because of the disjoint set implementation. It's going to be clear, but okay, just for now, take it for granted. Okay, I'm going to create, for example, the disjoint set. And we will have the cross-scale algorithm itself. And an application .java from where we are going to test our application. So the app.java. The vertex is basically contains a string of name. It's going to be the name of the vertex. And basically, we are going to assign a disjoint set node to every vertex because that's what we have been discussing, that at the beginning, every vertex basically a distinct disjoint set. Maybe you pose the question that, okay, why don't we define all the variables of the node class into the vertex class? It's working fine, but I think that it's quite misleading to merge the features of the disjoint set nodes with the vertex nodes, because basically both of them can be considered as a tree-like structure, both the graph and both the disjoint set. So that's why I think it is quite confusing to mix the node parameters with the vertex parameters. So that's why I have a node as a composition in the vertex. I think there's no problem with it. Okay, I'm going to have the vertex constructor. In the constructor, we are going to have a string name. It's going to be the name of the vertex. This dot name is equal to the name. And basically, I'm going to override the two string method. I'm just going to return the this dot name as usual. And I'm going to generate some get getters and setters for the node. Okay, Control Shift F to auto format. Then what about the edge? The edge is going to be your old friend, as we have discussed for shortest path algorithms and so on. So we will have a private double weight. We will have a private vertex start vertex and the private vertex target vertex basically every edge has two vertices a start vertex and a target vertex i'm going to generate a constructor so source generate constructor using fields with the weight the start vertex and the target vertex i'm going to get rid of this super method call I'm going to generate the getters and setters for all of them. I'm not sure whether I'm going to, going to use it, but anyways. And because the cross-scale algorithm is an edge-based algorithm, as you may recall, we have to sort the edges according to the edge weights. So we are going to use the collections.sort, and that's why we have to implement the comparable interface as far as the edge class is concerned. Of course, we would like to compare edges, so a given edge with another edge. And of course, why is it important to override this compare to method? Because then collections is going to ask that, okay, I know that I have to sort these custom objects, but according to what do I have to sort? According to the start vertices, according to the target vertices, according to the weight? Of course, we would like to sort it according to the weight. Basically, it is very, very similar to what we have been discussing when we were implementing the dash crash shortest path algorithm. There, we had to implement a comparable interface for the vertex because we have to define some numerical ordering as far as the minimum distance is concerned. Here, we are going to define the relationship between the edges. And of course, we would like to return the double, why double? Because the weights are doubles. So doubles.compare, we have to compare the first edge weight with the, I'm not sure what is the, okay, it is just the edge, the other edge that weight. 
Sorry, not wait. I'm going to use the get wait. Okay. So basically, Control Shift F2 auto format, and that's all about the edge implementation. What's very important that, okay, this is basically the same as we have discussed in the previous videos, but we have to implement a comparable interface. Why? Because the first step in the Kruskal algorithm is that we have to sort the edges of the graph according to the edge weights. And that's why we implement a comparable interface. We tell Java that we would like to compare edges with edges. And according to what? Of course, according to the edge weight, we would like to sort or custom objects. So that's all about the edge and the vertex method. In the next video, we are going to implement the disjoint set. So this node is going to be the building block of the disjoint sets because we are going to implement or disjoint set with the help of a tree-like structure instead of a linked list implementation. And basically, why is it good? You will see that, okay, we have to bother about disjoint set implementation. What's the difference between the node and the vertex class? But you will see that the Kruskal algorithm itself is going to be very, very compact. Approximately codes, very, very readable. And we can see that what's happening in the background we don't have to know about the disjoint set, by the way, but I would like to implement it together. Okay, thanks for watching. So what about the node class? We have been discussing that this node class is going to be the building block for the disjoint set. And why is it good to have a disjoint set? Because with the help of the disjoint set, we are able to decide in constant time complexity or approximately constant time complexity whether there will be a cycle in the graph or not. And basically, this is crucial for cross call algorithm. So the node will have a private ID first, so a private integer ID. It's going to be a unique index for each node in the tree-like structure. Then, as we have discussed in the theoretical section, we are going to have a so-called rank. It is basically the approximate count of nodes below this given node. So basically, it is something like the depth of the tree. Then, it's going to have a reference to the parent node. That's what we have been discussing, that all the nodes is pointing to somewhere. Pointing to somewhere. It can point to the parent node, or it can point to itself. If the given node parent is itself, it means that this is the root, so this is the representative of the given disjoint set. So, I'm going to have the node constructor. In the node constructor, it's going to have a rank, and it's going to have an ID, and it's going to have a parent. And basically, we just have to set the this dot rank is equal to the rank, this dot ID is equal to the ID, and this dot parent is equal to the parent itself. Okay. And I'm going to generate getters and setters for all of them. So basically, these classes are quite easy. There's nothing special about it in the sense that nothing, compl nothing complex. Okay. So basically, we have an ID, we have a rank, basically the height of the tree, and a parent node. Okay, so what about the disjoint set? The disjoint set supports three operations as we have discussed. The make set the union, and the find operations. I'm going to have some variables, so private integer node count is equal to zero. Okay, integers are initialized to be zero by default, but whatever, just to make sure that it is clear. Okay, I set it to zero. Then I'm going to have a private integer set count Basically, we would like to track that how many nodes do we have and how many disjoint sets do we have. Okay, zero at the beginning, and I'm basically have a private list of nodes or the representatives. As you may recall, okay, what is a disjoint set? A disjoint set is going to contain distinct unique items. And if we find, so if we look for a given item, then it's going to return the representative, not the value we are looking for. Okay, so the disjoint set constructor is going to get a list of vertices. 
this list of vertices is going to be the vertices of the graph. Okay. Basically, this dot root nodes is equal to a new array list, and we are going to have as many disjoint sets at the beginning as the number of vertices in the graph. So that's why it's going to have the vertices, vertices, vertices dot size. So what does it mean? That we would like to assign a distinct disjoint set, basically a node, to every vertex in the physical graph. Okay, and I'm going to have this make sets, and I'm going to specify the vertices. Okay, so what about this make sets? It's going to iterate through all the vertices, so four vertex V, for example, in the vertices list, and it's going to call another method, for example, make set on the V vertex. Okay. And this V vertex is basically going to create a new node. I'm going to call it N. I'm going to create with the rank zero. Then, then I will have the ID, the root nodes dot size. It's going to assign integers in ascending order, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So the root nodes dot size, and I'm going to have the parent as a null. And then I'm going to have the vertex. Okay, I'm going to rename it to vertex. The vertex dot set node is going to be equal to this newly created node. Then I'm going to have this dot root nodes dot add. I'm going to add this node to the root nodes. I'm going to increment the set counter and I'm going to increment the node counter. Okay, so basically we assign a single node to all the vertices in the graph. So that's why we eat the vertices in the graph and we make the distinct set. Okay, so we will have the find and the union as far as this joint set is concerned. So I'm going to have this public integer find and it's going to have a node as the parameter and basically I'm just going to have a current node it is equal to the n at the beginning and we have to look for the root basically we are looking for the representative so while the current node dot get parent is not equal to null we are going to have the current node is equal to the current node that get parent because we are looking for the parent and that's why the path compression is very very good because after the path, co path compression the current node parent is its direct neighbor so basically this while loop is not going to run very very long because the get parent is the representative always because of the path compression. So that's why it is a very, very good program in practice to do so. So, okay, then I'm going to have the root node is equal to the current node. Then I'm going to have the current node is equal to the end again. And basically, I'm just going to have this path compression. So while the current node is not equal to the root node. I'm going to create a temporary node. I'm going to have the current node dot get parent, then the current node dot set parent is equal to the current node. Oh, sorry. And then I set the current node to be equal to the temporary node. So basically, we have been talking about the recursive implementation of the path compression in the theoretical section. This is the iterative form. Basically, here we get a node and we find its parent. And if the parent of this is not a null, then we are going to look for its parent. So basically, in an iterative manner. 
and basically we are looking for the root node. What's the root node? It is the representative. This is how this joint set works. And first of all, I'm going to return the root node dot get ID. We are going to return the ID of the root node. And this is the path compression. It is basically writing the pointer up to the root node again, but make each node below a direct child of the root. This is the path compression itself. Child of the root. This is the path compression itself. And this alters the tree such that future calls will reach the root more quickly. So basically, this is how we boost up our algorithm. And this is why asymptotically, the find operation is going to take order one time complexity very, very fast. What about the other operation, the union? It's going to be a public void union. It's going to have a node one and a node two, so two nodes. And basically, it's going to merge two nodes together. And the node basically can represent a whole disjoint set. So this is how we merge two distinct disjoint sets together. First, I'm going to get the representative for both of them. So the index one is going to be the representative of I'm just going to find the representative or the root node ID for the node one. I'm going to find the same for the node two. So we have the index one as the first disjoint set representative and the index two as the second disjoint set representative. Of course, if the index one is equal to the index two, it means that these two nodes are in the same set we just return. We cannot merge them together because they are in the same disjoint sets by default. So there is no point in merging them, of course. I'm not sure whether it is clear or not, but if the representative for two nodes are the same, it means that they are in the same disjoint set. If it's not clear, then take a look at the theoretical section because we have been talking about. Okay. Then I'm going to get the root nodes of each set. It's going to run in constant time as well. So I'm going to have the root. So this dot root nodes dot get the index one. Because basically this is just the ID. A find is going to return the root dot get ID. Maybe another implementation is okay. I implemented it that it's going to return the ID and we are going to find the node itself. So the root node we have found with the help of this get index because we store it in a list. Okay, so we have the root two is equal to this that root nodes. By the way, it runs in constant time complexity, so it doesn't matter. It is a very, very fast algorithm. Index two. Okay. And basically, here, and basically, here comes what we have been talking about, the so-called union by rank, that we attach the smaller tree to the root of the larger tree. And that's why we have to keep track of the rank. Basically, this is the depth of the tree. And if the rank is bigger, it means that this is the bigger tree. So we have to consider that we are going to attach the smaller tree with the smaller rank to the larger tree with the biggest rank integer. Okay, so basically, if the root one that get rank is smaller than the root two that get rank, it means that we have to merge these two disjoint sets in a way that we have to attach the root one to the root two and not vice versa. And basically in code it means that, means that we set the parent of the root one to be equal to the root two. It means that we attach the root one and this disjoint set to the root two. Okay, else if the root one dot get parent is greater than the root two dot get parent, it means that basically we have to do a sorry, not get parent, of course, we have to get the rank. Sorry for that. Of course, we have to get the rank. 
then we have to do that root 2 dot set parent is equal to the root 1 and anyways it means that they are the same so in this case we are going to set the root 2 dot set parent so we are going to attach the root 2 to the root 1 and basically we have to set the root to be equal to the root 1 dot get rank plus 1 so we have to increment the rank of the root 1 okay and basically we have to call the this set count minus minus y because this is how we track the number of these joint sets this set count and basically after merging two these joint sets of course we have to decrement the number of these joint sets because we have managed to merge two these joint sets into a single one so of course the number of these joint sets has been decreasing okay so basically what this makes sets this make set operation is going to attach a disjoint set to every vertex in the graph. This is how we are able to run our disjoint set and or union find data structure algorithm. Then algorithm. Then this find is going to make use of the path compression. And basically we have a node. And for the node, we are going to return the representative's ID with the help of iteration instead of recursive method calls, which is get the parent as far as the parent is not null. Then the union is going to merge two disjoint sets together. And basically, this is the union by rank principle that we are going to attach the smaller tree to the largest one. Why is it good? Because our final tree is not going to be so unbalanced. And if the tree is not unbalanced, then the operations is going to run very, very fast. So basically, this is how we implement a disjoint set. Thank Hi. In this video, we are going to implement the concrete Kruskal algorithm together. So the Kruskal algorithm is going to have a single method, public void spanning tree. It's going to get a list of vertices for example, vertex list, and it's going to get a list of edges, it's going to be the edge list. Okay, of course, we have to import the java.util.list. First, we have to create the disjoint set. The name will be disjoint set, is equal to a new disjoint set, and we have to define the vertex list as parameter. Okay. Then I'm going to create a list of edges for basically the minimum spanning tree is equal to a new array list. Okay. Then we have to sort the edges in ascending order according to the edge weights. So that's why we have to implement this comparable interface with the edge class because we would like to sort it according to the weight. So that's why we have specified this compare to method like this. So we are going to use the collections dot sort, and we would like to sort, of course, the edge list. Okay. And then we are going to iterate through all the edges. So the edge, edge list. So basically we consider all the edges in ascending order because after this sort operation the edge list will be sorted and basically we just have to check whether adding this edge would form a cycle or not and this is why this joint set has been implemented because whether adding this new edge to the minimum spending tree would form a cycle or not if it's form a cycle then we are going to discard this edge and not going to add it to the minimum spending tree Otherwise, we are going to include it in the minimum spending tree. So first, we are going to get the start vertex I denoted with U. So edge.get start vertex. I'm going to have the V as the edge.get target vertex. And basically, we have to check whether adding this edge. So basically, this joint set dot find we are going to find the 
u.getNode is not equal to the disjoint set dot find v dot get node what does it mean what does it mean that they are not in the same disjoint set and what does it mean that basically this edge can be added to the minimum spending tree adding this edge is not going to form a cycle what does it mean that the find would return the same id it means that the representative is the same for the v and for the u node and what does it mean that they are in the same disjoint set and in that situation we are not able to consider that edge so basically if they are not equal it means that we are able to add the minimum spending tree dot add the edge we are able to include this edge in the minimum spending tree and basically we just have to union the u.get node we have to merge the two disjoint sets together and we.get node so basically here the implementation after implementing the disjoint set the node and so on is very very straightforward and i think it is very very resembles to the pseudo code okay basically that's all about the classical algorithm it's very very compact and in the end i'm just going to print out so for edge in the minimum spending tree i'm just going to print out that the edge dot get start vertex plus the for example some spacing okay plus the edge dot get target vertex plus some spacing again and i think that it's going to be fine okay we have to add some plus sign here i'm going to get rid of this import and control shift f to auto shift f to auto format so basically it is a very very compact code we just have to sort the edge list and iterate through the sorted edges in ascending order we have to get the vertices and we have to find out whether adding this edge to the minimum spending tree would form a cycle or not and if the find is going to return two distinct integers it means that they are not going to that this edge is not going to form a cycle so we can add it to the minimum spending tree and of course we have to merge the two disjoint sets for further operations okay i'm going to save it and in the application we can test it so in the main I'm just going to have some, sorry for that, I'm going to copy and paste a huge graph. You can download the source code because it would take a lot of time to do. Of course, we have to import it, java.util.list. Okay, and we have to implement the edge in a different manner in the sense that the last parameter will be the edge weight. So in the edge, I'm going to have the edge weight cut and paste here okay control shift f to auto format it's going to be the same so doesn't matter and let's see if it's working fine or not so basically the minimum spending tree is going to have the ac bd cd fg dg fh and the de edges what does it mean for example ac means that the edge between a and c for example, DE is the edge between the D and the E. Okay. And it seems correct because we have eight vertices. We must have seven edges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So basically it is working fine. But let's see some straightforward example as usual. We have, okay, sorry for that. We have three edges. And for example, I'm going to add some edge between the A to the B, for example, just one. Okay, from A to the C, we'd edge weight one, for example, and from the B to the C, with edge weight, for example, three. And I'm going to comment out all the others. Then, of course, if I run the application like this, then of course as we have expected the ab and the ac 
will be in the minimum spending tree. Why? Because this edge weight is very, very huge. What if, for example, the edge between the A and the C is very, very great, then of course this AC is going to be missing from the minimum spending tree, and the AB and the BC are present. So basically it's working fine on huge graphs, it's working fine on small graphs, and what's very important I think is this disjoint set implementation. I've been looking for this disjoint set implementation for a while, and I think that it's quite good. Okay, maybe we could implement these nodes related parameters into the vertex, but as far as I am concerned, it seems the bit better solution to extract those variables into a node class because we can separate it in the sense that this vertex is the vertex in the physical graph, but this node is basically just a virtual node in the sense that it is the component of the disjoint set. Component of the disjoint set. And we are going to assign the disjoint set to every vertex in the graph at the beginning. So that's why this make set is going to iterate through all the vertices, going to create a distinct node, and going to set the node for every vertex. Okay, so this is how we implement the classical algorithm, and again, it is a very, very compact code, basically like a pseudocode. Okay, we have to create a disjoint set, then we have to create the minimum spending tree to be able to track it, then we have to sort the edges according to the edge weights, then we have to iterate through all the edges, and with the help of the disjoint set, we are able to decide in order one, so constant time complexity, whether adding this new edge would form a cycle or not. If it wouldn't form a cycle, then add it to the minimum spending tree, otherwise just keep going. And basically, we have to merge or disjoint sets on every iteration. So basically, that's all about the cross-call implementation. I think that it is a very, very beautiful algorithm, by the way, and can be used in several fields, for example, k-means clustering, data analysis, and so on. So definitely worth understanding. Hope I could help a bit. Thanks for watching.